This is Daybreak Asia. We're counting down to Asia's major market opens. And we are looking like a pretty flat finish to the week, aren't we, Paul? Particularly as we head into uh, a US session that yields the non-farm payrolls numbers. Huge implications for a lot of the sort of, uh, you know, shifting expectations for the Fed as well as where the yen is from here. And on that, we're getting sort of more jawboning, of course, from policymakers. Yeah, that's right. There is still plenty for markets to consider today. The non-farm payrolls, as you say, and yeah, uh, Shinichi Suzuki trying to jawbone that yen lower, uh, really keeping the pressure on that uh, we saw thanks to the Fed, thanks to rising Middle East tensions as well. We've got a rising oil price and just now some blowout results from Samsung as well. Yeah, it's a, a relief as we get back to profit for Samsung. And of course, so much of this is on that AI demand story. We'll be watching that as a top stock to watch as we get into the start of trading in Korea. But take a look at uh, the open. Uh, a huge amount of negativity when it comes to the Nikkei 225, of course, as we see uh, some of that really carry through from the US session. Uh, it's down about 1.3% at this point. Uh, topics also trading lower by over 1% already. Already. This sort of uh, seeking of value trade is really becoming a little bit more tricky for what we have really has been a, a breakneck uh, record rally for Japan. We've seen more Japanese companies uh, making valuation boosting plans, uh, but all of this is becoming more of sort of a, a riskier play if you take a look at that gap between winning and losing shares traded in Japan at this point. Uh, dollar yen, as Paul mentioned, 151.30 is pretty steady. We've seen some attempts to go through that 152 level and uh, been largely unsuccessful and pulled back. But some of that verbal jawboning again from the finance ministry today, uh, hoping probably to keep that stability, particularly as we get into that US session where we get the non-farm payrolls. Take a look at Korean stocks. Of course, Samsung is very much in focus today, as well as some of the other adjacent AI and chip related names. We've seen the broader cost be down by uh, just about 1%, even as we had, of course, uh, as expected, pretty decent numbers out of Samsung profit rising along with improvements across its chip division. Also some improvements when it comes to the sales of Galaxy S24 smartphones. They were pretty robust as well. Um, but uh, whichever way you cut it, this is really seen as a pretty pivotal turnaround here. Let's get some more from those results. Our Asia Stocks reporter, Yu Kung Lee, uh, is with us. So uh, the expectations were, in fact, a, a beat. This will be a relief to, uh, to see that bounce back on the turnaround, particularly in the chip business. Yeah, that's right. So the if you look at the recent expectations from analysts, uh, they have been raising their uh, estimates of Samsung's first quarter operating profit, but the results show that, that uh, Samsung may have exceeded even that higher expectation that have been adjusted in the recent weeks. And that's probably because Samsung's memory chip division posted a lot uh, better result than expected. Uh, this might uh, this this is coming after four quarters of losses in Samsung's crucial memory division, and this. This might be the first time that Samsung will finally post a turnaround in its uh, crucial semiconductor division, and, and that's largely thanks to big demand coming from the artificial intelligence and also uh, and also from some of the legacy uh, personal smartphone and uh, personal piece, personal computers and smartphones. Um, and we'll get more details from Samsung later uh, later this month in April 30s. But uh, it looks like Samsung has done a lot better than what has been uh, what has been expected from the market. Yeah, well, the market certainly are buying the Samsung story at the moment. We've seen shares gaining a lot in recent weeks. So uh, where to from here? What's the next leg? Yeah, so the next leg the uh, the market is looking at is like Samsung's development on the HBM uh, front. Uh, the company has been seen as falling behind its rivals, such as SK Hynix, in the in the in the race for the high high bandwidth memory chip that's crucial for the AI accelerators, such as the ones that made by the NVIDIA. But there is growing expectations that Samsung may be finally be catching up uh, later half of this year, providing possibly its own HBM chips to hopefully some of the key clients such as NVIDIA. And in addition to that, um, there was an important uh, development on the one of the memory, uh, memory chip called NAND flash memory, which has been seeing huge price surges in recent weeks, and that might also also be coming from some of the demand from the AI data center, according to the city analyst Peter Lee. And that may be also be a driving expectation for higher um, share, share price gains for Samsung going forward. So if you look at Samsung during the first uh, two months of this year, the share has been lagging behind the global memory chip rally. But that expectation is now um, uh, making a change. And um, investors are uh, seeing a lot more share price gain in Samsung going forward. Uh, and it might 
may finally be able to catch up the, the, the gains that have been only seen in its rivals. All right, Asia Stocks reporter Yuk Young Lee there talking about those uh, very strong Samsung numbers. Uh, let's take a look at how we're tracking here in Australia at the moment. Uh, not too well. It is a bit of a risk off day right now. The market off by half of 1%. We do have one sector in the green, however, and that is energy. Uh, energy stocks better by a tenth of 1% in Australia. And uh, Brent crude, well, 24 hours ago, we were talking about it touching $90 a barrel. We're blowing through that. We're now at 91 18. Um, so oil prices rising on uh, rising Middle East tension. Uh, the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says uh, the country is getting ready to operate against Iran and its proxies. So the conflict in the Middle East is showing signs of possible escalation. And our M Live question of the day is when does Brent hit 100? Let's take a look at U.S. Treasuries as well. They've been moving also. Yields really slipped uh, when we got those remarks from the Fed's Neil Kashkari. Um, he was uh, talking about the possibility of no rate cuts in 2024. Market didn't like that. Um, we're also waiting on those US job numbers as well. We're expecting 200,000 more non farm positions for a fourth straight month. So, a very strong labor market in the US uh, is being forecast, which uh, really suggests there's no need for the Fed to ease and pushes out those rate cut expectations even further. So, with that in mind, let's hear what Neil Kashkari had to say. Wouldn't say they're off the table, but they're also not a likely scenario given what we know right now. If we continue to see strong job growth, if we continue to see strong consumer spending and strong GDP growth, then that raises a question in my mind, well, why would we cut rates? Well, our next guest expects the Fed to cut rates starting mid-year, leading to a range-bound dollar. Let's bring in Steve Bryce, CIO of Standard Chartered Wealth Management. Uh, Steve, you're, you're sticking with this expectation, as is much of the market is as well, that we are still going to see rate cuts this year. But uh, do you see some repricing going on? Do you think you might have to revisit that call in a few weeks? Um, I guess the answer to that is no. We've, I mean, we've, we've obviously kicked the tyres on this and we think that the first rate cut's still going to come in June. That's a, the thing, a view that we've had uh, since the end of last year. So uh, no, no reason to change it. Obviously, I mean, basically, you've just had a, a Fed governor who's not a voting member saying if things are worse than expected, then they, uh, from an inflation perspective and the economy remains stronger than expected, then they may um, not cut rates. Well, I, I could tell you that as well, right? So, um, you know, if if things go as expected, um, then you know obviously the Fed has signaled since December uh, and reiterated more recently that they, they, they really want to start on this easing pass. They see um, monetary conditions as being too tight, uh, and, and therefore you know they're really looking for an opportunity uh, to, to cut those rates. And obviously the employment report tonight is going to be a very critical input into that decision. So we've seen markets pull back on those remarks, also uh, geopolitical tensions as well. But when you see pullbacks like this, do you think, hmm, buying opportunity? Is good news actually good news? We've just had some great results from Samsung and this broader AI story is still strongly intact. Yeah, I think we're probably, you know, in, in a little bit of a, a shaky water in the very, very immediate future. I mean, if you look at the employment data tonight, that you know, the, the consensus is for uh, a pretty Goldilocks scenario, <clears throat> excuse me, in terms of, uh, you know, obviously wages decelerating, uh, employment growth still holding up pretty well. Um, and, and we've really gone straight line up. Uh, from an equity market perspective since um, the beginning of October last year. So some sort of pause and consolidation, maybe even a slight pullback, uh, shouldn't, uh, shouldn't be um, totally unexpected. We've actually reduced our risk in our portfolios a little bit this year, but we remain overweight equities because we see those uh, rate cuts as coming through and that supporting investment activity uh, in, in an environment where we, in a central scenario is for a soft landing, not for a hard landing. We've also heard uh, from Governor Oeta saying rates are dependent on more inflation target uh, stability or certainty. That tells us that the BOJ probably is in no rush either. So as long as that policy divergence continues to exist, does that Goldilocks scenario for Japanese equities continue to play out? 
So um, certainly, our, you know, our, our favoured market at the moment is still Japan. Obviously, we've seen uh, you know a little bit of uh, vulnerability coming through. I think what was interesting was obviously when the Bank of Japan tightened policy, um, the yen actually weakened significantly, and that obviously supported the stock market. Uh, again, Japanese stock market has been on a tear. It's been leading the global uh, stock market higher, um, and, and, and we expect that after maybe a, a short-term period of, uh, of weakness uh, to continue. Um, so, and this is not just an economic story, obviously. Obviously, although the, the, that is important, uh, but it's also a, a, a big long-term change in our, in our view of investor behavior locally, uh, where obviously investing in bonds, uh, negative real, real yields makes no sense, uh, and, and obviously equities have an inflation hedge. So we think this is going to be, it's going to be a gradual process, um, but could have very, very important implications for the outperformance of Japanese equities. It's interesting to me that you're overweight Korea because uh, the expectation is obviously when it comes to the governance and uh, value up efforts, it's going to take a number of years the way that it has taken Japan to get to this point. But in the meantime, you see opportunities still? Yeah, I, I guess what we're seeing is, and obviously, you know, there's, there's, there's two things going on from a career market perspective. So firstly, you have the uh, the semiconductor story, obviously, which we're all very aware of at the at the global level, um, but we're also seeing increasingly um, other markets in North Asia, and, and Korea is one of them, where they're sort of looking at what uh, Korea is doing on the corporate governance side and saying, okay, how can we? Um, we, we look at the market and try and say, look, a lot of the stocks outside of the tech sector look, uh, look undervalued. Uh, can we do something to encourage uh, investor uh, activity and uh, increased optimism in those sectors? Obviously, the car industry is a, is a major uh, part of that. So I think people are starting to borrow that. We're seeing a little bit of that coming from China. Actually, we're seeing it in the UK as well, obviously. Um, so I think people are sort of saying, why are we seeing some structural undervaluation and what can we do to that? And that's you know, so those two drivers for us um, should lead to uh, career market outperformance in the coming six to 12 months. Steve, great to chat with you as always. Steve Brass from Standard Chartered Wealth Management there. Well, coming up, Argentinian President Javier Millet is striking a softer tone when it comes to trade relations with China. Our exclusive interview is next. This is Bloomberg. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen has arrived in the southern Chinese city of Guangzhou, starting her seven-day visit. Bloomberg's Christopher Condon is traveling with the secretary and joins us now live. So, uh, Chris, can you characterize the nature of this visit? Because going into it, there were some pretty stringent remarks being made on wanting to press her counterparts in Beijing about overcapacity. Right. Sure. Well, good morning. Um... This is uh, just the latest, really, in an ongoing set of meetings that Yellen has pushed very hard to establish in her, her uh, quest to, I guess, regularize relations with China with respect to economic issues. Uh, but you're right. In the run-up to, to this trip, the Treasury has been extremely forthright on this issue of overcapacity. Yellen spoke about it when she was in Georgia last week. Uh, it was in the statement that preceded the trip. She spoke about it uh, to reporters during the trip. A senior Treasury official speaking with reporters uh, en route also brought this up. So it's clearly this is the number one issue that the Treasury wishes to address with senior Chinese officials when she is here in Guangzhou and in Beijing. Um, so it's absolutely the her top priority. So, what's a successful visit going to look like? Well, that'll be very difficult to judge, to be honest. Um, they've made it very clear that they do not expect any quote-unquote deliverables. You're not going to see any uh, memorandum, memorandums of uh, understanding. Or, um, I think the, the goal is for incremental progress in convincing the Chinese government from the Treasury side that the overcapacity that they view as fueled by um, excessive state subsidies is not good for global markets. 
they're going to get blowback not only from the U.S., but from several other countries, and they are getting blowback from other countries already. But it also won't be positive for a Chinese economy that is, by its own standards, struggling at the moment. Uh, um, so I don't think we're going to see any grand agreement or, or um, statements that we we all agree on what how it is that we're going to address this problem. It's more about communicating concerns. Now, I must say, I have been among reporters who have asked the secretary directly whether she will also be um, giving a message, uh, sort of a threatening message about retaliatory action that the U.S. could take if the Chinese don't respond in a favorable way. But she has shied away from any talk about retali retaliatory action. She stressed that she wants to keep these talks constructive so I, I do think it's a, a case of both sides wanting to make their arguments, put them out there, perhaps listen to each other in a setting that uh, is positive for the moment, and then down the line, perhaps see what else can happen. All right, Bloomberg reporter Christopher Condon there in Guangzhou. Uh, Argentinian President Javier Millet is striking a more pragmatic tone when it comes to China. It was just six months ago he had threatened to curb ties and he called China an assassin. Millet spoke exclusively with Bloomberg editor-in-chief John Micklethwaite. As for the Chinese government, what we've always said is that we are libertarians. And if people want to do business with China, they can carry on business as usual. What I said was that I wouldn't be aligning with communists. Um, and that's precisely one of the things. Who did I say I was going to align with? The United States and Israel. Do you have any doubt that that's my alignment, United States and Israel? No, but in fact, you have a very good, very good example at the moment, and I'll come back to Israel and the United States later. But now, as you know, in Argentina, the focus is on a Chinese space station in Patagonia that your predecessor allowed to get built. The U.S. says that the space station has military purposes. Um, will you close it down? Well, the point is this. Negotiations are beginning to uh, audit and inspect that because the Chinese say that is not the case. So we will move towards a situation. We will be looking at that. So that is not a problem either. Is a, is a factor in this the fact that you have that $18 billion currency swap line with China, which you do need? You need it for the reserves at the, at the central bank. It's a big portion. Does that influence your thinking on China? That situation has to do with an agreement that was entered into and which has to do with the trade exchanges between countries. I won't modify trade exchanges because I think there are trade exchanges between privates. Just as we have a part in our central bank, uh, they have, of course, their uh, central bank counterpart. I don't see a problem. And honestly, the uh, trade relations haven't changed. Not a problem. The problem would be if I was the Chinese government and, I, and, and you called me an assassin, I might be less keen to renew the currency line. Have trade relations changed? They haven't. Not one bit. So that is actually counterfactual. There's no truth. Argentinian President Javier Millet speaking exclusively with Bloomberg Editor-in-Chief John Micklethwaite. And we'll have much more from that conversation, including his views on Israel and the U.S., coming up later on Bloomberg Television, online and on the terminal. Now, subscribers can get more on that right now by going to NI Big Take Go. This is Bloomberg. up to date on the latest in the Middle East now and President Biden has told Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu that U.S. support for Israel's war in Gaza depends on new steps to protect civilians. Biden's warning comes after an Israeli strike killed seven people delivering food to displaced Palestinians in Gaza. The U.S. leader is facing increasing pressure to take a hard line against Israel as civilian casualties rise. 
And as ceasefire talks between Israel and Hamas remain deadlocked, Israel's economy minister, Nur Bakat, told Bloomberg that he doesn't trust Qatar to act as a mediator with Hamas. Qatar's Ministry of Foreign Affairs has called the comments lies and baseless accusations. Qatar is giving safe haven to Hamas leaders, funding trillions of dollars, buying their ideology in the United States, buying their way in all over the world. They're a, a wolf in sheep's clothes, and we have to realize that them, yeah, together with uh, Iran, are a big threat. Israel is scrambling navigational signals over the Tel Aviv metropolitan area as the country prepares for a potential Iranian attack. The measures were taken to disrupt GPS navigated drones and missiles that Iran or its proxies might fire on Israel. Tensions have soared between both sides following a missile strike which killed senior Iranian military officials earlier this week. Well, let's take a look at the yen jumping the most in nearly a month. Briefly uh, pushed through the 150 level as it strengthens rising tensions in the Middle East of boosted haven assets. Japanese Finance Minister Shinichi Suzuki said this morning that they won't rule out any options against excessive FX moves. Well, let's get more from our FX and rate strategist David Finity. And uh, David, an interesting morning today. Seems to be the yen's rediscovering its status as a haven. Yeah, a bit of risk off overnight. If you look at the uh, S&P equities, certainly about 2 o'clock in Asia time in the morning, which is basically the last two hours of US trading, the S&P dropped about 100 points. It was a steady grind lower. So about 100 points is still quite a decent move. So that risk off, so money going into um, safe haven assets, and obviously the yen and the dollar benefited, but the yen certainly benefited a bit more with US yields pushing lower. Um, the question is now, Will that continue when we have U.S. payrolls come out later today? Because obviously if that came out strong, then it would add to the idea of this higher for longer rates in the U.S. And you may see markets having to dial back Fed rate cut expectations yet again, which would support U.S. yields. So again, put dollar yen back under pressure. But certainly for the moment, the risk off is helping um, the yen. I'm sure the Ministry of Finance is quite happy about that. The medium and longer term, though, it doesn't seem like the Fed is in a hurry and it doesn't seem like the BOJ is in a hurry either, right? The latest comments from Ueda suggesting they want to see more certainty around uh, inflation numbers before they kind of pick up momentum. Does that mean that gap narrative kind of continues to play out? Yes, yeah, certainly it's a good point. I mean, so Governor Ueda has come out and said, look, basically they still need confirmation that the 2% the, the goal is going to be met. And if you look through the wording, he basically wants all this wage data to come in. And he's really indicating that it could be the autumn at the earliest before any, another rate hike it does come, if one is. And that really sets up the October meeting as a potential one. Now, if that's the case, then the ball really goes to the US side of the equation. And that really goes back to the Fed policy. And again, as you said, it comes back to how's that data come out? You have US CPI next week, you have payrolls today, both very important. Again, if they come in strong, that's going to support U.S. yields. That interest rate differentials then favours dollar strength. Having said that, though, as we've seen several times, the market is very happy to price in rate cuts if given any opportunity. So if the data comes in weaker than expected, the idea of three cuts or more, the market will more likely run with that, particularly if that Fed rhetoric after the data says we're seeing signs now that a June rate cut is on the table. Our oh, FX and rate strategist David Finity and that Fed rhetoric, amongst other things, are weighing on how traders are looking at energy and commodities markets. Right, take a look at some of the movers so far in the session, particularly concentrated here uh, in energy heavy Sydney. Right, we're seeing a number of the energy suppliers, Woodside Energy, up by just about six tenths of a percent. Santos, they're gaining pace, and even in uh, Japan and Korean markets, the likes of Impex and S Oil Corp, some of the big gainers. After oil extended those gains, Middle East tensions, they're pushing Brent over $90. And in fact, $91 was worth sitting at the moment, uh, with Israel increasing preparations for that possible attack on Iran. We're also seeing, uh, this is a picture across mining names here in Australia, a bit of a mixed picture. South 32 seeing some gains in emerald resources. We're seeing gold pulling back a little bit from a record, uh, but of course also watching that new 14-month high for copper prices as well.
We are getting just Australia trade numbers there crossing the Bloomberg. Uh, when it comes to February trade surplus coming at $7.28 billion, that is a little bit shy of expectations of $10.5 billion Aussie dollars. We're seeing that fall in February imports, uh, rise in February imports, I should say, of 4.8% month on month, a decline when it comes to the exports of 2.2% month on month there as well. So watching uh, some of these numbers when it comes to the uh, any kind of impact we see on the Aussie dollar. And of course, when it comes to expectations from the RBA, we have seen trade holding up pretty well with a bit more optimism that potentially we'll see better trade relationships uh, there with the likes of Beijing after the recent sort of uh, boost in communications and the expectation that um, these wine tariffs will be dropped as well, right? So we are seeing uh, a bit of a mixed picture there, a bit of a weakness in exports and imports rising almost 5%, Paul. Yeah, on the subject of weakness, let's take a look at how our major equities markets across the region are tracking, all in negative territory at the moment. The Nikkei, the worst performing, off by one and three quarter percent at the moment. And we have had a modestly strengthening yen. It uh, briefly had a 150 handle for a while there. It's just above 151 at the moment. Uh, the Kospi weaker too, off by half of one percent. And even the index heavyweight Samsung losing a bit of ground off seven tenths of one percent. That's despite a really strong first quarter numbers, but uh, just uh, not enough uh, to defeat this uh, risk off sentiment at the moment. Here's one of the reasons for that. Let's take a look at the oil price. That's been strengthening quite aggressively. Brent crude uh, has been uh, creeping higher. It's uh, right now trading at 91.12. And uh, we do have uh, uh, oil front, front month contracts in the steepest backwardation now this year all on geopolitical conflict uh, we heard from the Israeli Prime Minister uh, Benjamin Netanyahu saying a bit earlier that uh, Israel stands ready to operate against Iran and its proxies so Heidi the Middle East conflict showing signs of possible escalation we are also of course watching China US relations as always Paul and uh, let's get some more on when it comes to US Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen's visit to China. She's of course in Guangzhou for a couple of days before making her way to Beijing. Our next guest says the challenge for both Washington and Beijing is to make necessary progress without major political reactions or changing macro policies by a thousand micro cuts. With us now is Claire Reed, senior counsel at law firm Arnold and Porter. She previously served as the assistant US trade representative for China affairs. Claire, great to have you as always. And I did love the way uh, the phrasing of that, uh, you know, a thousand cuts. And uh, the delicacy of this is particularly pertinent when you're talking about an election year, right? Can they get the balance right? Oh, boy, that's uh, that's the $64,000 question. And um, I'm not sure that they will, because the expectations are, are going to be different on both sides. You know, if Yellen is coming, with a, a message to China that uh, tariffs are going to rise on strategic goods in the United States. Um, I think it's going to be hard to uh, conceive that China will not have some reaction. So we're really balanced on uh, a bit of a knife's edge here. Uh, but both sides really have incentives not to derail the relationship entirely, as President Xi demonstrated in his recent meeting with uh, U.S. and other multinational executives. The overcapacity issue was one that some pretty strident remarks were made going into this. And we know that this is an issue where the EU and the US feel the same way about China. The, the data that Bloomberg has crunched is actually quite interesting because it shows that a lot of the overcapacity is actually on sectors that uh, markets like the US have really uh, no interest in, you know, low tech goods, if you will. How much of this is just going to be kind of necessary political posturing again during an election year? Well, I think the interesting thing about some of the data are, is that it's indicating that China is putting a lot of money in its industrial sector writ large. So you're right that a number of these um, products may not be ones where the United States is concerned. But the the effort includes the, the technology frontiers, electric vehicles, et cetera. So it's not... Um, it's 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 really of real concern and frankly it's of concern indirectly even in the other sectors because of the impacts on developing countries economies you know to the extent that china basically causes deindustrialization in the developing world that's also a problem 
Uh, having been a, a U.S. Uh, assistant trade representative, uh, I'm just wondering if you can give me your thoughts on this. If Janet Yellen does take an electorally necessarily harsh line against China, is there a, an appreciation on the Chinese side that perhaps this is just optics? Um, well, first of all, I think um, Secretary Yellen's uh, baseline principles are uh, those of an academic economist. So she's going to be, in a sense, um, the most sympathetic interlocutor with China from the U.S. side, because she will uh, recognize the importance of the, of the macro trends and uh, will not be you know, overly uh, excited about um, embracing pure political ends. But that having been said, if she is trying to, if, well, if she is going to indicate that tariffs could be placed, higher tariffs could be placed on, on some key goods because of Chinese uh, behavior, uh, that's not going to be temporary. And when you look uh, to the bipartisan consensus on the need to be tough on China and the need not to have a repeat of some of these other problems, if, for example, in the aluminum and steel industries with real serious difficulties for market economy industries with the China flows of product. Um, I think it's, 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 it's not going to be easy to just wave this away. There certainly seems to be a desire on both sides to keep the level of engagement up. But uh, where do you place the risk of U.S.-China decoupling, uh, particularly post the November election? Ah, well, I think it, that really could depend on who wins. So I think the Biden effort uh, would be to try to maintain the core non-controversial non-security related, non-technology frontier um, uh, trading and investment relationship intact, because the two economies are very interdependent and they're very complex supply chains. So it really is counterproductive to try to blow it up. And frankly, we have a, we are not an authoritarian regime, so our companies are going to do what our companies feel they want to do in large part. Um, if if uh, Trump returns as president, I think things become massively unpredictable because his views are very personal and they can blow hot and cold and they are not based on uh, macroeconomics, um, but they're based on pure politics. So that's really uncertain. All right, Claire Reed. Unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there, but thanks so much for joining us. Claire Reed is senior counsel at Arnold and Porter. Still to come, we preview the Reserve Bank of India's upcoming rate decision, and we'll hear why MK Global thinks they'll wait for the Fed to go first when it comes to rate cuts. Might be waiting a while. This is Bloomberg. China's economy is slowing. India is vying to take its place as the world's biggest driver of growth. However, the path to that goal is filled with obstacles. Bloomberg Originals has been exploring the rivalry and the relative advantages of the two Asian powerhouses. The Indian economy is booming. This year, the country's GDP is expected to grow between 6 and 7 percent. India is the world's fastest growing major economy. We see India growing from about three and a half trillion dollars in 2023 to about seven trillion dollars by the end of the decade. Although the U.S. and China still dwarf the nation in terms of total gross domestic product, powered by a population of 1.4 billion, India could become the leader in global economic growth. Many of the world's investment banks have keyed in on India as a real prime investment destination right now. Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, Barclays, with so much investment coming in, companies around the world may soon need to have an India strategy. But what will it take for the country to get ahead? 
for now, China still holds the crown as the main driver for global economic growth. Its economic opening in the late 70s only accelerated after 2001, when it joined the World Trade Organization. It was the country that attracted foreign investment. It was the driver of financial markets and global capital markets. Every company around the world needed a strategy to deal with China. India didn't start to liberalize its economy till the 90s, and it's been a slow climb since. But with current levels at about 7%, growing just a bit faster is all it needs to surpass China. India's per capita income has grown sevenfold from the early 90s to now. There has been significant progress also in the financial markets. These boxes represent economic growth in 2023. China, on the left, contributed close to a third, while India took second place. But look at how this changes if India grew about 1% faster a year. By 2028, the new picture is this. Geopolitics and China's own internal struggles are tipping this trend in India's favor. What you're seeing recently is investors around the world, as they sort of shift out of China, are actually putting a lot of new funds into India. Nowhere is this more evident than at the Samsung Noida factory on the outskirts of New Delhi. This area was farmland a decade ago. Now it's the world's largest mobile phone factory, producing 120 million handsets a year. Samsung opened the plant in 2018 when business in China was becoming increasingly difficult. It isn't alone. As the Chinese economy stumbles, businesses from Apple to Boeing are looking elsewhere, and at India in particular. An engine of growth and a democracy that delivers. India was growing fast enough to take the lead as recently as 2021, and the government says it can do it again. But first, it must overcome some major hurdles in these key areas, manufacturing, urbanization, workforce, and infrastructure. Let's start with manufacturing. For decades, China has been the world's dominant force in manufacturing. China's the assembly line to the world. Manufacturing makes up 26% of China's economy, while in India, it's only 16%. You know, the government aims that uh, the share of manufacturing should grow up to 25% by 2025. To boost manufacturing, some 150 million Indians still working as farmers would need to move and take jobs at factories. This change would drive urbanization. Decades ago, both China and India had huge rural economies and were largely dependent on farming. In the 1990s, China very rapidly urbanized its economy, moving away from a traditional rural agricultural economy and to a much more modern urban industrial economy. 64% of China's population lives in urban areas. In India, it's 36%. India needs a lot more cities. There is a lot of progress already happening in terms of interconnectivity for, for the cities, more railway network, better infrastructure for airports and so forth. But there are crucial problems like water, like traffic, like urban housing that needs to be solved. An urban population supports a robust workforce. And in 2023, India overtook China as the world's most populous nation. And while China's population is aging, more than half of Indians are under 30, prime working age. It is going to be harboring the youngest workforce in the world. Now, this is very important because history has shown that whenever demographic dividend is on the side of a country, that country grows really rapidly. There's no point to having a large, young, growing population if you don't have enough jobs for them all. Unemployment in the country remains stubbornly high at around 7%. And in part because of poor quality of education, about half of all college graduates remain unemployable. On top of this, not enough women in India work. China has a female workforce of about 45%. In India, it's 29%. Closing the gender work gap could expand India's GDP by nearly a third by 2050. A lot of economists believe that if India can find enough jobs for all of these people, then really the sky's the limit in terms of what growth can be. An increase in manufacturing will in turn create demand for more service jobs and incentivize people to join an urban workforce. But to achieve this transformation, India needs infrastructure and lots of it. For a long time, India has been plagued by 
inadequate roads, insufficient or poorly maintained railroads, not enough airports, not enough seaports. So infrastructure is really one way in which China overtook India early. In the 90s, India's railway network was 15% bigger than China's. But as China's economy started growing, it quickly took the lead, and its rail network is now 60% bigger. India is making progress. The country's national highway network has expanded more than 50% since 2014. If India can address these challenges, then foreign direct investment will likely increase. That inflow of money is an essential driver of growth. But accomplishing all of this is no easy feat. India also needs to increase its ease of doing business. The bureaucracy is such that it is not very easy to start a business in India and operate. Even though the Modi government is behind on some of its goals, many in India remain optimistic that it can overtake China as the world's biggest driver of growth. So one thing really working in India's favor more and more recently is simply that it's not China. The administration of Narendra Modi recognizes that the U.S. and other countries in the West are looking for a partner in the region that's not China to sort of partner at a time when China is growing more assertive in the region and more closed off to foreign companies and foreign investors. Oh, wow. okay. And subscribers can see that report right now on the terminal and at Bloomberg.com. It's going to be up later on the Bloomberg Originals YouTube channel as well. Well, India's central bank is likely to keep its benchmark repurchase rate unchanged on Friday for a seventh straight policy meeting. Just three of 23 analysts surveyed by Bloomberg expect a change from its hawkish policy stance to neutral. And our next guest thinks the RBI will not precede the Fed when it comes to cutting rates. Let's bring in Madhvi Arora, lead economist at MK Global Financial Services in Mumbai. And uh, Madhvi, in terms of the Reserve Bank of India, waiting for the Feb. We heard some remarks today from uh, Neil Kashkari saying, well, maybe we won't get any cuts at all in 2024. So uh, to what degree is a potential lack of urgency from the Fed in cutting rates going to impact the RBI? Well, to a large extent, uh, I think through the last one and a half, two years, we've been pretty much back to the Fed. Uh, what we've seen here is that whenever there's been any pivot from the Reserve Bank of India, they've been largely led by, uh, you know, what Fed has done and how the uh, reaction functions of uh, other developed markets or uh, central banks have been. And I think to that extent, it would definitely spell over to the Reserve Bank. Um, uh, are we unlikely to proceed Fed. There is not much merit in that at this point in time. And it's just going to you know, lead to more noise uh, in domestic asset classes. So I think... It's best that policymakers sort of follow what is being followed by the West. Of course, domestic dynamics matter to a large extent. But at this point in time, given that incrementally we've not really seen anything worsen in terms of domestic dynamics or actually improve dramatically, I think it makes more sense for the Reserve Bank to actually see how the global dynamics are panning out and accordingly react. Uh, domestically, uh, what is the case for potential easing by the RBI? <laughs> Well, at this point in time, um, you know, inflation is definitely not a big worry. Uh, we'll see some, you know, summer-led hit, of course, that could uh, lead to an uptick in food inflation, uh, which has been a seasonal thing in India. But overall, if you look at the, you know, intrinsic inflation, which is the core inflation, that's actually been trending down. It is sub-4%, which is the, you know, broad target of the Reserve Bank on headline inflation. But the trend line on core has been comfortably lower. And that sort of gives a sense that, you know, an intrinsic demand in the economy is not is what, what's driving inflation as such. There could be some cyclical global factors and factors which are beyond our control, which could probably move that. So for example, Brent has been up almost 16, 17 percent since the last MPC policy, which happened in early Feb. Uh, that obviously is going to worry the Reserve Bank of India. And the fact that, you know, we are repricing uh, uh, the Fed uh, first rate cut in every month now, every week now, rather, would also, uh, you know, bother them. But domestically, I think things are pretty much where they were when we met in February last. How much of a concern is the weakness in the currency? Has it weakened, really? I'm not too sure compared to most of the Asians, right? If you look at uh, most of the other Asians, they've actually fallen much more. We're still relatively much more stable. We've been seeing consistent flows, uh, both on equity and debt uh, FPS side. The current account also has been structurally improving. So to that extent, there has been an intrinsic upward pressure on the rupee that we've seen over the last, uh, you know, 
uh, six months or so, and RBI actually has been keeping rupee extremely stable, uh, you know, with its uh, invisible hand to some extent. But I think uh, as we get into uh, the new world, uh, you know, you're probably going to be seeing most uh, Asian central banks pegging their currency uh, to CNH uh, than actually USD, because we are trying to compete with China in the manufacturing space. We are trying to create our own space in that front. We have a very high bilateral trade deficit of almost 40 percent with China. So against that, it doesn't have much of a merit to actually keep our currency uh, stronger against, uh, uh, you know, our Asian peers, specifically uh, CNH. So I think to that extent, uh, we actually have been extremely stable because we've been seeing consistent foreign flows coming uh, into India led by debt and equity uh, FPI flows, which I think could continue in the coming three to six months as well. How do you address the issue of youth unemployment? I mean, see, yeah, at this point in time, they are basically trying to focus on the manufacturing bit. Uh, you know, we are still lagging behind uh, our, our Asian peers who are basically export hubs uh, in terms of really creating that kind of, a, you know, low-end jobs which can absorb uh, the dev demographic dividend that we have at this point in time and probably that will stay for the next decade or so. I think it's going to be a very tricky uh, process for the uh, for the policymakers to ensure that they create demand and create productivity both together in India. It's going to be a tough task, so let's be very honest about it. I think they'll have to find ways and means to ensure that they do not focus only one part of uh, the growth story, which is manufacturing, and actually start preparing the uh, you know the uh, low skill labor uh, to actually be a part of some kind of services, be it manufacturing, value add services that they can probably uh, be absorbed in, rather than just totally focusing on uh, low end manufacturing uh, employment. I think we'll have to find ways beyond manufacturing to ensure that everything is absorbed. And India is not a manufacturing economy; it's actually a more services economy. Madhvi Arora there from MK Global Financial Services ahead of the RBI decision. More ahead on Daybreak Asia, this is Bloomberg. Let's just quickly check in on Samsung. Rebounding off session lows are still off by about half of 1%. This is despite posting a pretty good set of numbers for the first quarter. Uh, preliminary operating profit, $4.9 billion. That was better than expected. A good turnaround there in uh, the semiconductor division. Strong sales of the Galaxy S24 smartphone as well. That's it from Daybreak Asia. Markets coverage continues as we look ahead to the start of trade in Hong Kong. The China Show next. <laughs>